Thank you very much for coming to this lecture today uh, in this beautiful theatre. Uh, this is a lecture as part of Red Bull Music Academy's time at Lisboa Electronica. And we thought it would be appropriate to have someone who's been part of a rich and varied heritage of, of Portuguese music history, uh, from pop and rock music, music that you might have bought on singles in the charts at the time, uh, seen and performed in front of live audiences, and then also uh, more esoteric and international music, music that is part of a cult record that we'll be speaking about in detail today. So please help me welcome Mr. Carlos Maria Trindade. Hello. Hello. Good, you're working, you're with me. So let's go all the way back to the start. Tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Portugal as a young man in Lisbon and what kind of sounds uh, and what kind of music you were hearing on the streets at that time. Paint us a picture. Well, I was, I was uh, in the 60s. Uh, in the 60s, uh, when I was a young kid, um, we were living under a dictatorship. So m my remembering of the country is a closed country, closed upon itself. Uh, there was nothing coming from the outside. Uh, the, the music you had to get it uh, to go to London or to go to, to New York to get it uh, and to listen to it. There was one uh, radio program called En Orbita, which was a very good program that would show you the, the new things coming out in London. And they would play the, the whole record, not just one track or the other. They wouldn't talk in the, in the middle. Uh, they, would talk, they would have a text in the beginning, and then you would know the whole uh, record. And so this was very didactic, very pedagogic for a kid like me. Because uh, the only thing we listened in, in, uh, at the time was folk music, which was uh, patronized by the government. And um, Fado, of course, which was the urban, our urban uh, culture, music. Uh, so you had rural um, uh, folk and urban Fado. And that was about it. So then you had a big influence of uh, Mediterranean music, like uh, uh, La Chanson Française. Uh, uh, let's say our, our parents listened, our mothers listened to Chanson Française, to, to the Italian music uh, very much. Even the Spanish music was very popular, you know, romantic Spanish music, or the flamenco, or these kind of, of formats. But we were avid of going further, uh, the new generation, because we, we had uh, listened to the Beatles, we had listened to this uh, uh, hippie movement and this Woodstock thing. But it was all very blurry and very distorted, because mm. um, the regime considered it uh, a revolutionary thing, a dangerous thing, you know, that would bring uh, drugs into the country, bad habits, you know. So, um, it was very limited, as you can see. Uh, it's not like today where you have the internet and you can put the Beatles stuff and you have all the records, all the images. So, it was a completely different um, world. Uh, this is my remembrance. But things changed in 74, as everybody knows. We had a revolution, the dictatorship uh, was overthrown, and we could finally uh, have a confusion in the country. People were uh, discussing ideas for the first time, political ideas, philosophical ideas, musical ideas. And so it was interesting, because Lisbon became um, uh, a potpourri of uh, m a million influences that were restrained uh, up to that moment. So I'll give you an example. I was at the conservatoire studying piano, you know, because my, my tuition, musical tuition is classic. I come from the classical world. And uh, the conservatoire, all of a sudden, the, the master of, of, the, of the school was dismissed and uh, there was no direction. 
I mean, it was a bit of a chaos, of an anarchy. And from that anarchy, uh, meeting, direct meetings of people, musicians, started workshops, uh, started uh, work workshops, starting improvising together, uh, people with different influences, and the conservatoire became a kind of a, uh, a workshop uh, school. When so I started then uh, meeting other musicians from different uh, tendencies, and this is what opened my world. When you spoke about uh, bands like the Beatles, international influences, and uh, the tide of new music that would have been coming in, being exposed to music from the outside is being able to absorb another culture. Um, but what changed about Portuguese music necessarily in that time? You were describing the more rural kinds of folk music and then the more urban kinds of music. What, apart from being a young person and being overwhelmed and excited by new music from outside of Portugal, what influence did that swell have on music actually made in Portugal at the time? It changed all the all the all the um, all the um, structure of the music world of the of the showbiz, because we didn't have uh, 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 a live music room, uh, we didn't have PA systems, we didn't have managers, we didn't have technicians, we didn't have video clip know-how, so all of a sudden we had to make everything, not only the group, but build the management, build uh, the the roadies. Uh, start to to build everything around us uh, to structure to, so that we wouldn't fall into a chaotic thing you know I remember going with my keyboards to the north of the country and there was no electricity no stable electricity so I had a roadie I was playing and, and you have the memories right that change the sounds and as the electricity was not uh, stable the sounds kept changing so I had a roadie, just, he was down on his knees, <laughs> and he was putting a finger on my preset, so that the preset wouldn't jump. So I remember this. I also remember playing without a PA system. Just how like... How did that work exactly then? Well, it was, a, it was a fair sound, you know, like uh, you have these fairgrounds, you have with, with this tiny sound, rough sound, you know, no, no basses, nothing. We played like that in those conditions, without lights, without the stage, uh, without um, catering. We wouldn't even talk about catering, of course. This was a utopic thing. I think if there's no lights, you're not too worried about catering, right? Because you're playing yeah, in the dark on the no floor. Yeah, if there's no lights and no sound, you, you wanted a sound, you know, electricity, electricity, okay? So uh, the, the country was not prepared for electrical music, right? That's the conclusion. And so electrical music, as you know, is difficult because to have a, a sound with quality, you have to have a good technician, a good PA system, and a good room, right? And we hadn't. So we had to start, you know, that's why I think that's why punk was so popular in Portugal, because punk didn't need much. You just need three chords on the guitar, a bit of noise, and to, to make a social charm, you know, like giving your message rough message and go away. And, so w and what was that message at the time, if you're drawing inspiration from punk? Well, punk, I wasn't a punk, but I played with punk musicians. That, uh, that's where I got really interested in, in, in pop music, was uh, the new wave movement, uh, the post-punk. Because the punk, I, I came from the classical music, so the punk seemed to me like too basic, musically. Right, the message was in interesting because it was revolutionary, but the music was too basic for me. It was three chords, and and uh, they're all the same chords, and you would change the rhythm, and uh, that was it. So when post-punk came, uh, uh, like new wave, new wave is not a movement; it's a kind of a, it, it's a big, uh, a big. Uh, uh, scene where many things uh, can put in, you know, like uh, you can put sky, you can put uh, reggae, you can put, you know, you can put many, you can put the clash, but you can also put the police, but you can also put lots of styles, you know. That's why it was interesting. It was not a closed 
style. So I got interested in, 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 in New Wave and that's where I got invited to enter this Corpo Diplomatico. It was the first group, not professional still, but it was the first organized group uh, where I belonged, Corpo Diplomatico. This was 79, roughly. Um, this group would give origin to the famous Heroes du Mar group, okay? Uh, Heroes du Mar was the same formation as Corpo Diplomatico with another singer, because our singer was so irresponsible that we had to give him the sack. <laughs> this was a bit like attitude at the moment. Nobody knew what the profession was. There was no profession, being a pop artist, you know? So we had, even we had to learn what being a pop artist was, what was the responsibilities, the schedules, being on time, uh, rehearsing, you know, all this. We started from scratch. As you mentioned earlier, your schooling in music, though, was very, very different to this, very different to punk, very different to new wave, very different from discovering how to be a pop star. Tell us about you going to study music at a conservatory here in Lisbon. What was the predominant style or the, the, the school of thought about studying music at the time? Because it was a classical repertoire. Yes, right? it was the harsh movement. It was the, the Russian, Russian discipline. Mm -hmm. So my, my teacher, uh, she, 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 she thought discipline was more important than anything else, than sensibility, for instance. So she would tap my fingers each time I would, uh, you know, make some wrong movement or play the wrong note. Or uh, it was very harsh. It was you had to study lots of hours, and uh, you wouldn't get a twenty. You would get a twelve, thirteen note. It was very difficult to be good, you know. Uh, so I remember being in a room playing uh, uh, some jazz chords on the piano. And comes uh, comes someone in the room and says, "This is not allowed. What you what you playing? This is not classical. This is diminished sevenths and ninths, and you cannot play these chords on this piano." And I was astonished. Why was jazz anti-musical? And then I started asking questions. I was a kid. And I said, "This is not right. If jazz is not allowed, there's something wrong, right?" Uh, so I, I, I left the classical world because I entered an electrical group. I played, uh, I liked the organ. Uh, there were no synthesizers still. So I played the organ in this group. And then I started buying synthesizers. Then the Moog came out, the clavinet came out, the Fender Rhodes came out. You know, the, all, all the gadgets, electrical gadgets, start coming out and affecting the music in real time. And this is why all the 80s, and all this, even the 70s, but ab above all the 80s, you would listen the new rhythm machine from Korg on a certain rack, and you'd go, ah, oh, this is the new Korg rhythm machine, you know. So music and, and technology, they were really attached, you know. The organ is an instrument that has followed you around for pretty much your whole career. Uh, what was like the first time that you saw and heard an organ being played and thought, yeah, this is for me? Well, the, the alternative was the piano, but the piano is a, is, a, is a piece of furniture, right? You cannot carry it. I mean, you're not, in Portugal there were no rooms with a piano, so you had to move, you know. If, if you were a keyboard player, you, you would have to, to go for uh, an organ. Uh, there was no alternative. It was an organ. It was electric. You could play loud with the guitars, uh, and even had a bass on the on the feet, right? And it had two keyboards where you could have two different sounds. So it was paradise for me. It was paradise. It was uh, wow, what a power! I can pump up the volume, and you know. And this was all very new. Then came the synthesizers. So to play with the guitars, you had to be loud. So the piano was no good. Uh, I had to go electrical, uh, and and so I did. Uh, nowadays, I I'm a little bit 
uh, on the opposite side. I go back to the natural sounds. Uh, I play piano, acoustical piano, I play Fender Rhodes, I play clavinet. I, I went back to all these vintage sounds, you know. But this is a consequence of not nostalgia, but the necessity to go further on the technique, I think. Because sometimes the keyboards are too easy, sometimes. Was your interest in the organ ever spurned from the more grand, like spiritual kind of church organ yes. as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. When I went to the conservatoire, I didn't want to learn piano. My aim was to uh, enroll the organ classes. But there was on only one teacher, and there were no vacancies. So they said, oh, if you want to start this year, you either go to the piano, or you stay at home and come next year, and enroll the organ classes. Mm -hmm. And so I went to piano. But I wanted the organ, because the organ always made me the creeps in the churches. And so uh, I wanted to be, there's another thing I like about the organ, is that you, you, you turn your back on the audience. See what I mean? You're not visible. Uh, organ music, the, the music com comes from God, from the spheres. And it's meant to resonate on, on the stones of the, of, the, of the chapel or of the church and to impress the listeners, you know, to impress the, the people that are assisting to the Mass. And I like that role, which is not visible, but... And so you are free, you have no social contact with the audience. I like that. But then I got, I got in a trap. I went into a pop group that became famous. So it's the opposite, you know? Because it's a very un-pop star thing to want to turn your back and yeah. be unknown. Or punk thing, it's a punk thing as well. It's a punk thing. But uh, yeah, I got into a trap. Uh, I wanted to play the organ, never did. Uh, I played the organ, but it's not a church organ. I wanted to not become famous, and I did. I didn't want people to take my photos, and they did. Uh, I was on the front covers of the, of the newspapers and everything. And plus, uh, we made a group that was highly polemic, and that was accused of being a Nazi group. So it, <laughs> it was, and I'll tell you why, because uh, our first record had a discover. This cover has the, a cross, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not an Aussie cross, right? This is the front of a boat, of a fishing boat. And we took this symbology because we needed one, and people called it Nazi. But this is not uh, the only reason. Heroes do Mar, if you know, it's uh, the first two words, the first three words of our national hymn tune, right? It's like, I don't know, the English tune starts with? The English tune starts with? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. I don't know what the first words of God Save the Queen is. You don't know? I don't sing it very often, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Iraj Mar is the beginning of our... So these two, these two elements uh, are, are very strong. And that's why we chose them. They're strong. Unfortunately... We, this was 1980, and we had a revolution in 74, which means that people were still fed up with, um, uh, and afraid of a, of a new dictatorship, right? So people said, nah, these guys are fascists. We must stop this. And when this went into the shops, people didn't put it on the, on, on the, on the how do you say, on the um, mantra, on the... Um, on the counter? Yeah. yeah. They wouldn't show it. They were afraid. And so the record didn't sell much. So we made a meeting and we said, are you going to finish? No, we cannot finish. We must carry on. But the label was very worried because they were getting pressures. Nobody wanted the record in the shops. It was not selling. And uh, when we would go to the radio, to make an interview, everybody was menacing us with swastikas on the on the <laughs> on the glasses of the of the radio station, and so we said, "Well, the only thing to 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 do is um, a dance hit." And we made a dance hit, and we made the first dance hit sang in Portuguese. So 
It's called amor, which means love, right? And we made this huge hit and uh, released the maxi, and it was all, all the discotheques were passing this tough, 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 all the radio stations, and it was. We sold, uh, I think, 80,000 maxi singles uh, in two weeks or something like that. And so we became professionals. That's it. And the polemic went away. Because meanwhile, people, we were talking about um, the discoveries of the Portuguese uh, uh, overseas, all the adventure that was going in a, in a small uh, wooden, uh, now, how do you say now, is a caravel, um, a ship, you know. And you would cross the Atlantic and uh, uh, you would uh, discover new worlds. So this was the, let's say, the, um, the story of our record, right? And this is our cross, the cross of an order, uh, um, the Templarish, the, it's an order, religious order, but they are also fighters. Anyway, we wanted to be uh, strongly symbolic, but maybe we went a little bit too much uh, on, on the symbology. Uh, if it was today, it would be okay, nobody would care. Uh, but at in those times, uh, it was, the country was really political. O all conversations were about politics because we were cho the country was choosing its, his way, you know? Where do we go? And so everybody was discussing, which is good. It's good to discuss where you're going. So this was what be, uh, allowed us to become professional musicians. And from the here on, uh, I started producing and helping other bands in the studio and uh, started a professional life. That's it. When you talk about becoming a, profes a professional musician, studying at a conservatory for classical music, classical repertoire, having your fingers tapped for playing jazz, the, the cognitive dissonance between that and playing new wave music and releasing pop singles, what of your musical education did you take with you into studios or was it just a total breach? No, it's very useful. I'll tell you, uh, listen, um, studying music uh, doesn't go away, it stays with you. Reading music is extremely important when you work with other musicians, because you can take your own notes, and you can you can be always on the on the on the right point in, in the arrangements, in the structure of the music. You know, you can be very organized, because as you know, in in popular music, not many people uh, read. It's not necessary. I mean, you write lyrics, you play a few chords, and then you make a song. You don't have to read. You know, music. But reading music for a producer is very, very important. For instance, comes a, a brass player and plays a wrong note. You, are, you know you play the wrong note because you have the, the score, right? And if you didn't have, you'd have to listen all the notes, you know, and it would be difficult. So my education being classical was very important because uh, it's a weapon you have. Um. You might not have taken a church organ with you on tour that wouldn't quite have worked. So kind of set the scene for us of what were the contemporary music technologies that you were using at this time that you were able to develop this sound. Because New Wave is very related to British and American pop music and it's all over the continent. But I'm curious about if these machines are becoming much more accessible and everyone can kind of get them. What specifically was it about your sound that felt akin to Portuguese like pop and new wave, what was special about it for you and what were these technologies that allowed you to do that? Well, the sound was, was not uh, strictly Portuguese, but the lyrics were. We were one of, one of the first groups to write in Portuguese. A uh, generation before ours, which is the 70s generation, uh, used to sing in English, uh, funnily enough. And uh, they were good groups, uh, very good groups we had. Uh, but they were singing in English. And we asked ourselves, why in English? Why not in Portuguese? Ah, because Portuguese is a very difficult language to sing. It's true. We have funny sounds in our language. Uh, and that when I've been touring uh, abroad, people confound us with uh, 
uh, Russians, w once they, they came to us and, and asked, are, are, you, are you Russian musicians? No, 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 we are Portuguese. Ah, Portuguese. Your sounds are similar to Russian. Russian, maybe, yeah. And we have the tr, tr, the, this kind of R's, w which are the same as, as, as in Russian. So these sounds make it difficult to write good lyrics. But then we got specialized. And so we started studying how to write in Portuguese, you know, and sing. Uh, this was the main difference, because the rest, we were using uh, makes like uh, everybody else. We were using uh, Roland, Korg, uh, you know, the instruments were the international makes. So it was not through the sound, but through the lyrics, basically. Can you tell us more then about how the language and the act of writing lyrics impacted on the actual sounds itself. Could you, could we perhaps listen to a record from that time with some Portuguese lyrics and then you could tell us how the language would have impacted the music itself? Well, it impacts. Some things are not possible, like uh, the rhymes are completely different. Uh, English language is open, like uh, it's much easier to make a rhyme, right? And when you sing, you go, ah, ah, it's good for the singer, right? If you have to go, you or e, you know, we have this e, which is very common in our language. It's terrible for, for singers because it's nasal, right? So nasal means part of the air goes through your mouth and part goes through your nose. We even have this till, you know this sign, mm -hmm. till? You don't have it in English. No. The Spanish use it on top of the N, okay? And we use it on top of the A's to make, a, for instance, a till on top of an A with an O goes on, on, which is nasal, right? Otherwise it would be ow, see? So these little uh, things uh, make you think on, is very difficult. So I'll change the, the word for another thing and I'll change the rhyme. Uh, plural in Portuguese is with an S, right? Uh, so you, you must go, irmão. Irmão, irmão is brother in Portuguese. There you go with the till. And then if you want the plural, several irmãos, irmãos. We put an S at the end. This is terrible for singing, you know. So you have to know these kind of uh, things, you know. Yeah. Uh, in English, brother. It's easy to sing. Brother. Brother. Irmão. You know. <laughs> so it's a big difference. I get your point. Absolutely. So we, yeah. we had to study. We had to, you know. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's very difficult. And but sometimes you only realize when the singer comes and says, this is impossible, man. What are you writing? This, I cannot sing this in this octave. Mm. Uh, so you go and change. You know. But why, I'm interested then, why continue to do it in Portuguese and not just go, Ugh, we'll just sing brother, we'll just do English? Because we, uh, it was a path that hadn't been done, right? So it had been done in fado and in folk, but never in electric music. So we wanted to give it a try. And uh, nowadays you have groups uh, writing in Portuguese and in English. Uh, it's not so important if you do it, but we've done it because at the time there was nobody singing in Portuguese. And then uh, uh, the records sang in Portuguese started to sell because of us and Rui Veloso, another singer that made a big hit. And uh, as Little labels uh, wouldn't believe that uh, music sang in Portuguese would ever sell. They started to see sales. And so they started to invest. And that's it. That's how we created the, the rock movement of the 80s in Portugal that produced about, I don't know, hundreds of groups. Hundreds. Every day you'd have a new group. It was amazing, you know. Shall we listen to something from that time so yes, that can. everyone can get in the zone? We can listen to, for instance, for Something of your own would be ideal. For the lyrics, we can listen to this artist. He's not among us anymore. It's called Antonio Variações. I produced his last record along with Pedro Aires, my partner. 
and we can listen to the first track, maybe. It's kind of a singer that gave us a big... It was very pleasant to produce because his energy was amazing. So tell us a little bit about that track that we just heard. What was your role in it? Because I can see, even though my Portuguese isn't great, uh, that you did play a hand in that record. So tell us a little bit about that and the sounds that you were working with at the time because that feels extremely of its time yeah, as well. It is. Uh, it, this is a, a, an example of um, a singer that had no group, right? He had no musicians. So what the label did was contract a, a few musicians to make his record. Uh, he only released two records, then he died. He, he was the first case of AIDS in Portugal, very first case of AIDS. And he died just after making this record. Uh, he made two records. The label was very in intelligent, it was EMI. They decided to give his first record to a Porto group and the second record to a Lisbon group, right? Lisbon group was Heróis do Mar. And the uh, Porto group was uh, GNR. It's also a very popular group uh, that still exists. Still exists, GNR. So what they did is, uh, if this singer doesn't have um, uh, musicians, but he wants to be a pop artist, we're going to give the production to a group. Not, not a producer, but to a group. And uh, uh, it was a clever, it worked. It was a clever move because they both records are different uh, and uh, when when you when you ask for a group to make a record you have the arrangements resolved you have the production resolved you know even the sound was a bit our sound but with a different uh, singer right so it was it was uh, uh, quite interesting what would you say your sound was at the time then our sound was uh, one thing one thing alive and another thing on record. Why? Because we didn't have the know-how to make records. There was not, uh, as we were the first ones to go into the studio with a different approach towards electrical music, there was no know-how. We didn't have anybody to tell us, do this, do that. We were experimenting with the mixer, with the instruments, and so if you listen to some records today, you say, ah, this was not very good sound. But the ideas are there. The studios were not investing in technology because it was very expensive. Outboards, uh, good reverberations, good compressors. You know, we had nothing of the kind. We had to improvise, you know. And so now there is two generations of recording musicians and you have know-how. You have schools. Uh, so at the time we were just experimenting, which is also good. That's it's very good. good. Yeah. Um, speaking of experimenting uh, in that regard, we're going to travel over quite a lot of genres and decades today. Um, and this is coming at the tail end of, this is, this is like the mid 80s, like mid 84. Yes. Um, how, what kind of access did you personally have to these technologies, if you're saying that there wasn't much of an industry to access, where were you sourcing these machines from, and who were you working with? Like, set the scene for us in that regard. Our role was to make some pressure on the studios to buy material, right? So we were saying, if you want a better sound, you must invest on a good equalizer, a good compressor, a good you know, all these kind of things that outboards that the studio didn't have. They had good mixing mixers, but they had nothing else. And so we were buying all these magazines, you know, to study the machinery. And we were uh, saying this, telling the studios, buy this, you must buy this, you might, must buy that. And then they started, because with the success of the records, the money uh, started pouring in. Uh, they, uh, the editors started selling, the studios starting, started having job, a job, you know, uh, and uh, they started to be well equipped. Uh, at the same time, uh, we were learning what the management does, learning what is merchandising, 
learning how to dress to go on stage, learning uh, how to make a good light, a lighting system. You know, all this was, we were the first generation to deal with it, you know. So you were essentially being rewarded through music sales. With we were pushing equipment. our way, you know, pushing our way and saying you must invest, you must do this, you must do that. So that's what we did. What, um, what other kinds of music were you listening to at the time to get inspiration? If you're saying that although you were writing the lyrics in Portuguese, it was not super specifically a Portuguese style. Um, who else were you listening to at the time that was influential for you? Uh, the, music, the music after after this uh, French and Italian, uh, the, the chanson française, the, the Mediterranean sound came with the Beatles and that generation of groups, the, the English sound, right? The English and the American sound. They entered uh, accompanied, accompanied by the hippie uh, folklore. You know, all, all this hippie folklore that we listened to, that we saw uh, uh, abroad, came here and uh, you started to have uh, all styles of music that you have today. You started to have uh, rock, folk, electrical music, you know, all electric music. Um, we were very influenced by, in fact, by all, all kinds of sonorities. Uh, meanwhile, groups like Pink Floyd were coming out. This was before, but, but uh, the new wave groups were very strong, you know, because the sounds were very eclectic, very different, you know. There was not a rule, right? Uh, this is not symphonic rock, uh, it's not uh, reggae, it's not... Uh, what is it, you know? And that's why I liked uh, new wave. You didn't know what it was. It was not a style. It was a, a kind of a movida, a kind of a, a way of life. Uh, night clubbing came you know, uh, all this was uh, interesting in the 80s. Let's uh, leave Portugal and go to London. You spent some time in London in yes. the 70s, I believe. What were you doing in London and who did you meet? Oh, I was not making music. I was surviving, basically, yeah. Because I had fled the country. Uh, I didn't go, we had a war in Africa. I didn't want to, to go to a war. I didn't want, I didn't want to kill people. So I said, I must, fly, I must uh, go away. And so I forged all the authorizations necessary and uh, I fled. I went uh, to Paris, Amsterdam, hitchhiking, and then uh, I couldn't stay in Amsterdam. Uh, and I went to London and got a job in a hotel, washing dishes, uh, doing whatever. And uh, I was two years. Uh, working here and there, uh, knowing uh, several parts of, of England. Uh, and then meanwhile there was a revolution in 74, so I could come back. And that's it. It was two years of exile. A self-imposed exile, almost. It was a self-imposed exile, but uh, I was very interested because I could see concerts in London. Uh, so I could see, I don't know, I even saw, I think I saw Pink Floyd in Hyde Park. I saw um, a Soft Machine. I saw all these groups in pubs, you know, pubs had a lot of music. Don't know if they still have, but. Yes, they do. They do, but uh, I was amazed by the amount of music uh, there was in a town like London, you know, because each pub had its group. Uh, plus you had uh, the concerts in the parks. Uh, free concerts in the parks, plus you had uh, the good venues uh, to go and, uh, and listen. And so I was happy to, to go to concerts and absorb a thing that was impossible here. There was a style that was really burgeoning at the time, uh, particularly in the 70s, with um, minimalism and experimental minimalism and ambient music. I know that you spent some time with David Toop, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about who he is and what you two would have discussed and learnt together when it comes to music? Uh, you, you're asking me, uh, we discussed with, I discussed who, what, with, with who? With David Toop. Ah, David Toop. Oh, no, I was invited, this was a few, a few years later, I was invited to go uh, 
to to participate on the on the London Festival of Improvised Music, and David Toop was the organizer that year. Uh, they had a, a, a London collective musician, a London London Musicians Collective organization, which was based on a new on a unused um, trains train station. Okay, it was interesting. And so uh, I met all these avant-garde uh, improvised music uh, milieu, which was uh, a thing that I didn't know even existed, with gigs, uh, organized uh, tours, uh, and things. And so I met all these musicians uh, that were not uh, pop musicians, jazz musicians. They were dissident from all these these kinds of, of music, and they were do, uh, trying to play together, uh, improvising. Mm. So I, find, I found it very interesting because I had been reading John Cage, um, I had been listening to uh, Brian Eno and his amazing theories about sound and music, and I got very much interested in going on, on, on other areas, into other areas, you know that were not the pop framed pop music, you know. Mm. It's just pop music is, it has a frame like this. You cannot go away from that. And it's very social. You must interact, you must be visible. And uh, all, all these movements are the opposite, you know. Uh, the music is a bit for itself. Mm. You know, the music is an abstract art that lives on itself. Mm. Doesn't matter much the portrait of the musician who, who does it, you know? Apart from the social and uh, aesthetic aspects then of, of not being a pop star in that regard, what about the music and the sonics did you find particularly interesting? Because this is a style that you would go on to work with um, to quite some acclaim. I think pop music produced very interesting personalities that uh, were dissident from pop music. And uh, Robert Fripp is an example, Brian Eno is another example. It's the examples of, of musicians that were involved into very popular and famous groups, uh, made tours around the world, uh, uh, Fripp with King Crimson, uh, Brian Eno with Roxy Music, but they said, I'm not staying here, I'm going away, you know. Brian Eno, for instance, decided to go away, as he says, when he was playing a gig, and instead of being concentrated on the concert, he was thinking that he had laundry to wash. See what I mean? He was not there anymore. So he said, well, I'm, not, I'm doing nothing, I'm leaving, right? And he started all this interesting uh, ambient music uh, uh, thing. Uh, through these people that went away from the pop music, I think it's uh, very interesting to find them doing a myriad of things that evolved the, the, the music business to other parameters and other experiences. Well, your sound evolved kind of in the same way, and I think we should maybe talk about a record that you made in 1991. Uh, shall we listen to something from that? Yes, this is uh, an example of uh, going, uh, going away from pop, you know, going away from pop and doing something else in a duo. It's called uh, Blue Terra, it's from Mr. Lugalu, a record made with Nuno Canavar. Oops. What was that we were listening to? Tell us a little bit about that. Blue Terra is a, is a, is a track from uh, Nuno, Nuno's side. We divided the, the record into two sides, right? My side and Nuno's side. But we interacted uh, in the arrangements. So it's an interesting method. Um, this is an example of coming away from the pop world yep. and closing yourself in a room for six months and doing this without listening to any music. Just two musicians, two computers, a mixer, a Dolby system, 
uh, a few outboard rocks, synthesizers and samplers, and your imagination. And that's it. You know. Because you were in Perioz de Mar for pretty much the whole 80s, yes. 81 to 89. And then this comes, you record this in 89. Yes. And it comes out about Nine. a year or two later. Yeah. Um, the stylistic leap from Herios de Mar to this record is quite astonishing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you met your collaborator, Nuno Caravaro, and what compelled you to start making this music? Well, let's say that the, this was already inside us, but we were busy doing pop. Uh, on the other side, it was pop that uh, allowed us to be professionals and living on music, through music, not having to do other jobs, right? So pop had this limitation, but also this advantage, mm -hmm. okay? This kind of music, at the time, we wouldn't live on this kind of music. The record was praised, but a past unknown. Uh, there was not much public in, in, at the time in Portugal for this kind of music. And as the label was an independent small label, didn't have the power to export the records and promote it abroad. So it went into, uh, it went into uh, you know, uh, uh, a few people uh, always uh, were listening to it and saying, ah, that record is in temporal. Uh, it seems like it was made yesterday. How could you do that? And I was amazed when uh, these Spanish editors from Barcelona uh, contact me through Facebook and say, uh, I was listening to this record you made and I think it's magic. Do you want to release it? And I said, what? 27 years afterwards? Yeah, yeah. We think it's magic. We want to release it. Can we get licenses and everything? And so we started this process that took one year to try and free it from contracts from uh, uh, previous release, to make a contract, to make a new mastering, to make the original cover, uh, everything. And they were very good, very competent, and uh, uh, they made a fantastic release. And they, they put it alive again, you know, it's amazing. Did you own your own master tapes? Of this record, did you did you physically have them, or were they in the in the in the control of someone no, else? No, there was nothing. Even the art, the art cover was lost. Even this art cover was lost. Uh, this cover has a very funny story. It's it's from the portfolio of uh, of an artist that uh, is my, our friend, a painter. Can you open to to take the, this little stripe out? And I went to his home and asked, uh, "Do you?" Can you show me your portfolio? Because I like your work and we're doing a record and maybe you have some drawing or something that could be uh, good. And uh, I, I find this. And then we didn't have a, a title. So as I was uh, reading uh, some uh, ethno, ethnomusicology book by Levi Strauss, and uh, it had some names of African instruments. Uh, I went to the book and saw this Ulugalu. Ulugalu is um, an African drum, earth drum. So it's a hole you you open in, in the, on, on the ground, and then you cover this hole with either um, thin wood or a skin, animal skin, or even better, uh, a small uh, tin, tin thing or metal, metal. A sheet metal. Yeah, and uh, then you play, you you play drums on top of it, and the earth resonates, like the, the whole soil resonates, you know. And uh, I think I liked the idea of Ulugalu, and as we had this. Personaggio, who we might eat Mr. Lugalu. It was just a, a like a joke, but it worked. And so you're a, a musician that resonates with the earth in yes, this regard. Yes, yes. I, I, I read a lot about the origins of music uh, because uh, when you work, when you deal with your profession, you should know the history of, of 
the profession, and uh, our profession is dealing with sound. So I'm always, even today, very much interested in the origins of sound, and in sounds in general. That's why I moved to the country. To I moved to the country, people ask me, why did you move to the country? Because I have silence, and that's it. So from silence, I can work my music. If I don't have silence, like in the city you don't have silence, because you have a constant humming of about 10, 15 dBs, right? Constant. And your, your, um, your uh, limiar goes from 15 to whatever, 100. But I have from zero to 100. So I, I have dynamics because I have absolute silence. Sometimes, of course. Uh, sometimes you have planes passing by. Even at 10,000 meters, I can listen to planes in the country. Um, but it's interesting to to know the history of sound. And this drum, uh, whole, uh, whole uh, ground drums were the first uh, instruments uh, of the world. Not with metal, but with uh, skins and with other materials. The, uh, but the original one, uh, people who study think it was not the drums, it was the voice of the mother. So it was lullabies, the f very first songs, the very first musical sounds that uh, the humans invented, let's say, were lullabies for the babies. Even, even so the mother would, would uh, entertain the children with lullabies. So you have the human voice, female human voice, and the drums as the origin of uh, instrumental music, right? Which is very interesting. Uh, that's where Lugalu comes from because Lugalu is an ethno ethno thing, and the record has a lot of ethno little micro atmospheres, so it's interesting. Those atmospheres come from a discipline within music that is akin to fourth world music. That's the concept. Um, I know you're a fan of John Hassel, kind yes. of the forefather of this style. What about fourth world music do you find interesting and was applicable for this record? Well, we were, we were uh, in fact, we were uh, sampling from radio, from uh, TV, from video. We were sampling from records because samplers were machines that had just come out. We had, uh, my sampler could sample 13 seconds, which was magic. But nowadays it's ridiculous, because in computers you can sample 10 hours, if you want, <laughs> of sound. So we had to make uh, big gymnastics to put the samples. With the time we had, mm -hmm. we had to be really economical mm -hmm. to, to make the samplings. Mm -hmm. So we were, uh, sampling was a recording process that uh, gave a lot of power to the musician. Because all of a sudden, you not only had the sounds inside the modules and the synthesizers, but you could put sounds from the outside mm. into the synthesizers and mix it. And this rec record is, is a bit of, of those experimentations we made, you know. What sources were you sampling from for tracks on this record in particular? Because there is quite um, a murky sense of, of cultural fusion that mm. comes with fourth world music that seems very much as a a colonial kind of music tourism that yeah. doesn't honor the sources of the sounds. Were you doing a lot of these field recordings yourself? Were you drawing from film and television? Like, what kind of specific examples could you give us that are present in your work here? Well, this, the samples were a bit... Uh, this record had a very, uh, how should I say, exigent selection. We made two records and only one, only one came out. So we had more 10 or 12 tracks that never came out. And as the rest, it got lost. It was on cassette tape, and it got lost. So these, the samples you listen here are a bit, uh, how do I say, random. It's random. Like, I would, uh, Nuno would have some, some ideas and would show me. And I'd say, wow, that's fantastic. But he would have to agree that it was fantastic. Otherwise, it wouldn't be released. And the same with me, you know. 
So we were very exigent on, on the selection we made, but we were really going mad sampling everything because it was a novelty. So, you know, it was very recent, the technology. Um, maybe if it was today, today I'm not sampling so much. I'm using uh, more the synthesized sounds. Maybe because it's, everything's been sampled. I mean, if, if you listen, uh, we sampled uh, in factories, uh, uh, industrial sounds, the urban sounds, uh, everything. Uh, we sample the voice and tune it up. We reverse it. We do whatever, you know. You, today you can do uh, choirs of non-existent persons. I mean, you can just compose for an orchestra without a violin. You can do, it's not a novelty anymore. It, because it was a novelty then though, I'm curious to keep it kind of contemporary, maybe were there acoustic instruments that you were working with that were, were, were able to tell a story that was specific to your experiences? Like for example, there are a lot of strings on this record. Um, and I'm curious to know if that came from the 12 stringed Portuguese guitar and the storytelling element of that. Is there a story behind the strings too? That's specifically Portuguese perhaps? Yes, because the concept of the record is instrumental. It's not sang. You can listen to some voices, but they are sampled, right? We never had a singer in the studio. Uh, everything was done by us too. So, um, we, we, we didn't uh, have uh, an external opinion, you know? It was very difficult if you think that you are five months uh, closed in a room, two heads discussing. We discussed a lot and we were uh, talked a lot. Uh, because uh, doing music is very cons is very tiring, and so we would make breaks, you know, tea breaks, and in the tea breaks we would talk about every everything but music, you know, everything but music, traveling, uh, you know, Africa, uh, I don't know, any any subject, and then these ideas we discussed would go into our work somehow, you know, uh, so it was a lonesome uh, project. So we have to find techniques of making a record without the voice, without the singer, you know? Because in the pop music you have singer all the time, right? The music is made for a singer. And for the first time we were doing instrumental music, so we had to come up with all these tricks, little ambiences and strings, because the string is the second most powerful thing after the voice. It's the violin, right? The expressiveness, the ambient it suggests. So we, we have to, you know, invent uh, interesting atmospheres beyond the human voice. I'm surprised actually that you would say the string is the second most expressive seeing as you've played organ and keys for your whole career. But the organ is not expressive. You don't have uh, dynamics. You either put it on or you put it off, right? And the violin has uh, vibrato, has, uh, uh, you can grow your sound, you can do very, uh, an interpretation, a dramatic interpretation. What we were looking for is dra dramatism, right? Which is difficult to do with synthesizers, dramatism. Synthesizers are not done for dramatic expressiveness. They are done for electronic, uh, or for uh, sequencing, or you know, all this kind of, uh, it's more f on that way. So we made the question of playing everything. This record is all played, it's not sequenced. Mm. We, we made a couple of concerts and we played these pieces alive. And people were coming to s on stage to see if there was a sequencing mm. backtrack, and they couldn't find one. Describe to us then what it would have looked like to see this performed live if there were no sequencers being used on stage. How did it look? How did it move? It doesn't move. I mean, it's two people seated, one in front of the other, so it's not very interesting. Surrounded by what, though? Yeah, surrounded by machines, and the only thing that is alive is the music. But this is our idea. It's the anti-pop, right? You have no painting on your face. You have no strong light, spotlight. Uh, we didn't even have lights. The light was still. 
It's the anti-show, right? It's the anti-show. It's the music uh, by itself. But it's uh, one of the most interesting concerts I ever made, if, I, if you ask me. It sounds not too dissimilar to you trying to play keyboards in the north of Portugal with the, the press button. <laughs> well, uh, nowadays it's different. We have good electricity. Um, we have internet, we have, you know, it's so, so different the world. We have maybe too much information nowadays, it's the opposite, you know. Uh, I, we complained about not having I information, right, in the 70s. Now perhaps we complain there is too much information and you must filter, which is the most difficult thing. Filter your information. Actually, speaking of filtering the information that might have gone into this record, when you said that you and you know didn't really talk about the process so much, you just went in and did it. Um, what kind of spiritual or conceptual things were you thinking about? I know that your attachment to the organ did stem from the sense of spirituality and like the devotional power of this instrument. Were you thinking about s spirituality when you were making this record? Well, we had we had a reclusion, like a monastery, right? Because you were not listening to any music, it was part of the contract, not to be influenced, right? Because when you listen to much music, one thing is influ influence. The other thing is when you listen so much that it becomes part of your musical technique, right? And this is dangerous because you show it immediately. And people listen and say, ah, this is a bit like ta-ta-ta-ta. Ah, this is a bit like ta-ta-ta-ta. And you're done. Because if you are like ta 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 is better, right? Imitation is never better. So we were thinking, we must be original, and we don't have a singer, and we only have this stuff. How are you going? We were really uh, full of responsibility of this, you know, because Nunu is a very serious person. Uh, when it comes to music, I'm also very serious, so we were really serious about it, you know, like, you know, well, how are we going to do this and uh, all this? And through this responsibility, we made a good selection and uh, only the best came out. I mean, we could have made a double record or another record, but we were there, chop, 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 chop it out, chop it out, it's not good enough, chop it out. And this was what, uh, but it, there is a monastery, monastery attitude towards, it's hard because during five months you don't go out uh, you don't listen to other music because you you don't want to because you you are already tired of working all day all day long you know uh, and so we would talk 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 not about music about other things talk talk and this talking and exchange of ideas uh, worked worked uh, what I say to musicians is don't just talk about music talk about other things because you're going to learn something that will influence you on your next tune, you know, on your next uh, ambient, on your next music, you know. But there is a religious uh, attitude because I was a Catholic uh, brought child, very strongly Catholic, and I'm a dissident because of that. But the religious impact uh, stood, you know, it's still here. So I need religiosity, not necessarily Christian, you know, I'm more inclined to Buddhism nowadays. Uh, I think it's a clever uh, religion because it centers, centers yourself in, into yourself. I mean, God is, in, is here, he's not in the sky. See what I mean? He's inside you. So I find it more interesting, you know. And you feel that that tendency or, or tendency towards or interest in Buddhism was fed into like the process of making the record then? Yes. The uh, Buddhism talks a lot about, and uh, Buddhist uh, poetry talks about uh, a lot about nature and silence. So, uh, nature is one thing I'm surrounded by now, uh, which is good because nature is, uh, for me nowadays, almost as important as humankind. You know, which is a thing that a few years ago I was completely urban and I wouldn't think about it. You know, I would say, no, 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 no. I need people around me. So w what I could was uh, get silence, 
uh, and uh, the importance of nature. So this goes along with Buddhism, you know, more than uh, with uh, Catholicism, I think. Because um, David Toop actually once said that uh, silence is a kind of noise. It has its own information, and you just have to be perceptive enough to understand that information. So it's interesting that you become more inclined to nature when you're around silence. Yeah, silence is the support of music. It's like the canvas is the support of of the of the painter on canvas. You know, uh, so you you come from silence, which is zero music, uh, and you start building from there. And when you put a wrong sound, a wrong sound on a track, you'll never get the track back, because the wrong sound is there, you know. And sometimes you have to destroy and go back, and take away that sound, and put another one, a good one, so that the things work. I always remember a Brian Eno history. He was um, mixing, he was composing on his studio, and there was some works on the next building. And so he was listening to a humming of a machine mm -hmm. that was going mm, all the time. And he never realized it. So he was composing around that sound, around it. When the work's finished, he was listening to the tape. This doesn't work, he said. Ah, I know why it didn't work. The machine sound is not there anymore. So he had to recreate a kind of a drone, you know, imitating the machine so that the piece could work. This is amazing. This is a person who listens good, you know, which is uh, what we are specialized in. Musicians should be specialized in listening good, but it's not always the case. So uh, I find it interesting then that your musical journey would be to become a better musician, you have to become a better listener first. Yes, I think so. Especially well, maybe not in the pop music, because pop music has, uh, is, is formatted. So s I found musicians that didn't even listen to the whole group on stage. And I found it very strange. I said, you don't listen to the bass? No, 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 it's too loud. I don't want to listen to the bass. I said, how do you play with him? Ah, oh, we know, we know. It's a routine. See what I mean? Do you feel then that you've become what's the best way to say this, a bit more cynical about pop music, having done records like this? Yes, not only about pop music, about society in general, because uh, we are, I think we are moving away from, from things, uh, because the, the, the offer is so, so good, so big, so, uh, you know, the more we have, the more we want. I mean, this is our nature. We all know about it. And we're having a lot, lots of information, lots of new cars, lots of technology. Uh, we even are having uh, lots of people controlling this technology, uh, affecting the statistics with logarithms, uh, con trying to control your, uh, your, yourself, mm. uh, you know, as, you, as, you, as you've seen recently. So it's dangerous, it's dangerous times we're living, I think. Uh, they're not naive anymore, but I'm not, uh, I don't want uh, to go back to naivete. I don't want to go back to the dictatorship and the lack of information. What I think is we should uh, educate our kids to filter. And this is what they need, is a filter, because it, can you imagine the information they're going to get in one generation time? It's going to be huge, because maybe it comes already from the moon or from Mars. You know, when you start putting all these planets with people living in it and information coming from there, can you imagine what, what go, uh, is going to happen? You know? I would, uh, if you made this on Earth, I'd be very curious to hear what you might make on Mars, so. <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, I, I, this, this record, I think it's good for an astronaut. Yeah. Yeah. Could be good for an astronaut to listen to, you know. Um, Carlos, thank you very much uh, it was a for pleasure. talking to us. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Does anybody have any questions for Carlos? Anyone? Anything you're curious about at all? Yeah, sure. Can you get one? Thank you. Um, I really liked your, uh, the, your second album, the Blue Terra, and uh, it made me think a little bit about Japanese uh, sounds from the, the 70s, especially the more minimalistic movement. And uh, you were speaking as well about Buddhism, um, so I kind of connect the dots between the Om and uh, the minimalism. Did it have an influence on your work? Did we have? Did it had an influence in your work, Japanese music? Uh, well, uh, not only Japanese music, but Japanese society in itself, because um, uh, the, the first contact with Japanese society was, for me, was like, what's this, you know? Uh, what's this hierarchy? What's this futuristic way of life? What the way they live, it's, I mean, it's su suburban, I mean, it's crazy. But then you start going into the minds of people and and what what do you find? They're extremely polite. If you go and play in Japan, the public has a reverence towards the artists. Uh, at the end of the show, they come and offer you things, like presents, you know? They make a queue, and they come with things, flowers, uh, tea, uh, painting, even paintings they used to offer us. So this reverence makes... Uh, uh, the relationship with silence that I was talking about in Buddhism, which is respect, okay? Because sound is a thing that uh, if I make noise, if I'm painting, nobody listens on the other room. But if, if I'm making noise, everybody's going to listen to this noise on a, on a circle of, uh, I don't know how many meters. So you must think that um, uh, noise is like uh, water. If it finds a little hole, it goes in, you know? And I, I think this reverence makes you think that we are in a noisy society, uh, not only ideologically, but uh, because of this all, all this information and all this noise about the uh, truth, uh, it's more and more difficult to find the truth, right? Uh, before, you had one father that told you the truth and you could not move from there, right? This is no good either. But now it's the opposite. You have many truths, and you have to find a good one. Um, the Japanese have a very hierarchical society, harsh one. It's a labor society. Uh, it's made for work. Uh, they are in the firms about 13 hours a day, even if they are sleeping on a corner. But they must be there. Because if they're not there, they're not well seen by the boss. So it's very harsh. But when they come out and go for a drink, they are amazingly non-brutal. Uh, I never saw in, in Japan an aggression on the street. Never. I never saw two Japanese fighting. How is it possible in towns like that with millions of people, you know? There must be something they learned. It was not the Americans, so it must have been uh, it was not the Marshall Plan, it must have been Buddhism, the origins, maybe. I think about this. So, I will always be influenced by this oriental pacifism that I don't find in the West. I find that, okay, we are in a very competitive society, but we cannot avoid fighting, you know. We should be competitive without fighting, through your work, right? Not through a uh, gun uh, or through, well, uh, you know. Um, this is what, what I don't like in our society, is uh, too aggressive, physically aggressive. And the Japanese society is, is specific. They have other fights, okay? They have very, very strong fights. For instance, the role of the woman is still a fight for the woman because there is a lot of laws in Japan that... Uh, uh, consider the woman still uh, serving the man. This is the other, the other side of the other side of uh, ancestry of, of of history. You know, uh, but in ge in general, I love uh, Japanese uh, frame of mind. I call it software. They have a different software. You know. Thank you. Anyone else?
Hi, thank you for everything you said. It was precious. Uh, you were talking about the fact that uh, musicians should specialize in listening good, uh, but also the fact that uh, our daily life is ruled by over-information. Uh, how do you think these two things relate? Like, how can we perceive or filter uh, everyday sounds uh, with so much noise around us? And how can we educate towards this uh, awareness of sound? Well, I think it's a very slow process. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe s a few people in this room had never thought about this. So the fact that I'm saying this, uh, maybe people start thinking, oh yeah, when I do a sound, other people listen. When I paint, people don't listen, it's different, yeah. They don't see it, then they listen. So uh, we have to have a, uh, an altruistic, um, an altruistic uh, attitude uh, towards sound. Not me and my sound, but be sensitive to other people's sounds. Even the urban sound can be interesting. I mean, even, even a factory sound can be interesting. But it's not uh, next to my room where I sleep. See what I mean? Um, it's uh, on the place for, for being a factory. What we have to is open our ears the same way we opened our eyes. You know? We are in a visual society, basically, not in an oral society. So our ears, uh, if you listen to, if you see a dog or a cat, you can move the ears, right? And when he moves the ears, he listens on that direction. And each ear moves in a different direction. So they are highly sophisticated in uh, listening. We are very basic, because our ears that used to move uh, in the, in, uh, before, don't move anymore. Why? Because we don't have necessity to move. But they used to move. Uh, so we have, we are not the best at listening, you know. We listen to about um, 20,000 hertz at the maximum, well, let's say 17,000. And cats and dogs listen to 50,000, 60,000 hertz. So they can listen to a noise that happens on the other side of the street, and we can't. So we should be humble. We are not the most sophisticated beings uh, on Earth. Uh, as far as it goes on listening, we are one of the worst. Uh, so we should be humble and educate our ears uh, more and more. We are, maybe we are not uh, developing our ears as we are our eyes and our uh, ability to manipulate uh, technology. Anyone else? We do have time if you're curious, but if not, that's also okay. No? Well, um, thank you. Oh, wait, hang on. We want another one. You're only allowed two maximum. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to be so <laughs> annoying. Uh, you were talking about your, your album that was released on a um, label from Barcelona. Um, Lena Dog was, um, uh, Jardim's Logic now was, was made a repress on a new uh, label from New Zealand as well. Uh, do you think that there's more uh, recognition from uh, our work, our more experimental work that was done in the 70s and in the 80s by uh, other countries than inside our own country? Maybe there is, it's not my role to say, but uh, what is amazing is that with this final, uh, the final nostalgia that is happening, uh, it's the most interesting thing in the industry, in the music industry happening, because the CD format was a, was a flop. It was a very interesting for the labels to make money in the, during the 90s, but uh, as a format, it's not interesting because it's too small you have no space for art cover. The lyrics cannot be read. Uh, you must go and fetch uh, something to to, uh, to to see the lyrics. And uh, and this is uh, an object. This is an object. Uh, apart from uh, the music inside, you have a cover, well visible. Uh, you can read the 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 things, and. Uh, it's proven that uh, the industry committed a big mistake when they went to CD, you know. The quality is not good. 
and the, the format is uh, plastic, uh, small, and interesting format. That's why he is killed. It's killed. And this, is, this revival is uh, blessed because it permits uh, records like this to come back, you know, and many others. So I bless this uh, revival. I don't know how it happened. Nobody knows. Uh, it's a question of uh, going back to origins or going back to analog, you know, going back to distortion because this allows distortion and uh, CD doesn't allow a distortion. Distortion is, you know, it's different. And here you can, you have a good headroom and you can uh, control distortion in the mastering process, which is very interesting. The distortion is there. You cannot really listen to it, but it's there and you, you, the harmonics are there. So you, in the end, you listen to it. You know. That's why people like the vinyl. It, it's an elastic, uh, an elastic uh, environment. It's not strict, you know, like, like the CD. You know. So I, I think it's because of the vinyl uh, revival that this came back to life. You know, uh, it's not only the music. Uh, music rarely exists in itself. Uh, there is always some other thing attached to music. Either the face of the beautiful artist, or the vinyl revival, or a label that decided to invest in, in that, uh, in that uh, artist, and that's how you know it. Brian was saying, Brian Eno was uh, interviewed for Red Bull, and he was saying a, th a very interesting thing. I know lots of music that have as much quality as a known music, uh, a known music that has as much quality as known music, and nobody knows it. Why is this? This is terrible, you know, to know that there is music, fantastic music, that ne never reached an audience, you know. Why is that? Nobody picked up on it. Uh, there was no vinyl revival, no editor. Uh, he was unlucky. You know, how many things, uh, good, good, fantastic music you don't know? Many, many, many music. Why is that? I think there's always some piece of random process to make things happen. You don't have a decision on your own life. I never decided to put this uh, record out again. It was the editors. So it's not because of me, but I only made the music. I it's what I made. So maybe the work I'm doing today gets known in 20 years' time. It's a good hope for me. It's fantastic. It's always good. Carlos, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.